Hello everybody. Today's topic is introduction to reliability and resiliency testing. Let me introduce myself. My name is Jyotir Mahipula. I'm working as a performance engineering architect in an MNC in Bangalore and I have uh, over 22 years of experience uh, when I have created this video. Uh, I am a PSR engineering architect and uh, I have experience in application hardware network and OS tunings. I earlier worked on uh, telecom defense, healthcare, banking and insurance domains. Now in my new company, I have an opportunity to work in aero buildings and industrial domains too. Lucky me. Let me introduce the topic of reliability and resiliency. As part of PSR, we do a lot of various types of testing, uh, load testing, endurance, stress testing, spike testing. We do breakpoint, we do scalability. We also have reliability and resiliency. As the word reliability and resiliency in a proper English dictionary mean, it actually means that the system, the software, hardware, everything together, the system on which I am doing the PSR tests is actually reliable. As an end user, can I rely on my application to be useful to me when I really need it? And my needs and my wants as a customer are various and they differ. And for my requirements, is the application available to me? Is it reliable? Can I rely on it whenever I need in whichever situations I am in? And is it resilient? Resiliency is basically the amount of impact during failure the product can take, the system can take. These are like the basic understanding of what an application needs to be when it is actually reliable and resilient. PSR, when it comes to reliability testing and resiliency testing, is not about making it fault free. It's not about making it bug free. It is about understanding and accepting that there will be failures. There may be failures in various situations, untoward situations, but will my product, will my system bounce back to normalcy after the fault, after the failure? How quickly does it come back? And when it comes back, before it fails and after it fails, before it comes back to normal, what is happening in the product? How is the product or the system behaving? Do I have any losses? Can I control it? If there are losses, how deeply are those valued? How deeply do they affect the customer? This whole entire concept is what the perspective that is needed for reliability and resiliency testing. Once again, this type of testing in PSR is not about making the product fault free, but accepting that there will be faults. We need to just handle them. How do we handle them is what is important. And when we handle them, how much is the loss and what is the value of that loss? What is the impact of that loss? Is what is all about reliability and resiliency testing. Now that we understood what reliability testing is, I have divided them into hardware reliability, software reliability, and operator reliability. Having said that, PSR has no standards and the sky is the limit for the various types of tests and how you can make a product more stable, proactively as well as reactively. So there is no hard and fast rule that hardware, software, and operator reliabilities are the way that needs to be uh, bifurcated for reliability test. It is my way of bifurcating it. So hardware reliability, let's talk about it. Um, hardware reliability is actually the 
measurement of how stable, how available, how reliable the application is or the product is when there is a hardware failure, which means the software, the network, the OS and anything else is actually stable and there are no issues and one of the hardware fails. In different situations, different types of hardware fails, but in when the hardware fails and it bounces back, how reliable is my product is hardware reliability. Hardware reliability can be tested both at component as well as system PSR phases. In component phase, component PSR phase, the reliability of the component is measured when the hardware fails and it bounces back. It can be put on a load balancer and one of the master nodes can be pulled down. And if the standby node comes up, how many errors does the component throw? What kind of data loss does the component have? Is the CPU increasing or is the memory increasing? If it is increasing by how much percentage and how much time does it take to come back to normal again? These are the different types of tests you can do within component, component uh, phase as well. When it comes to system PSR, uh, I'll be explaining it in my further videos. What are the different types of hardware reliability tests we can do? Let's move on. Software reliability, as the name suggests, is when the software fails while the other caveats are actually constant. This too can be done both at component PSR as well as system PSR levels. Let's talk about operator reliability. This is a unique scenario. Operator reliability is neither hardware nor software or both. It is when there is a interdependency products or modules that are connected together to make an entire end-to-end -end product. So my product can have plug-in, plug-out modules. Plug-in, plug-out products itself can have interdependent products. For example, I am having a platform product on which there are three applications which are using it. One of the application does the analytics on the data that comes and sits into the platform product. Another product uses the metadata. The third product may be using the uh, analyzed data and does some more activities and events on it for the, uh, to be taken as an application which the end user uses. They're all interdependent. The data flows from on-prem, for example, or from the cloud, or from an Eastern cloud and from a Western cloud. There may be data that can that was processed from the cloud and actually sent back to on-prem. There are many things that can happen in these kinds of products. There are databases involved. There are multiple applications written in different technologies involved. There may be cloud and on-prem involved. So these are the types where multiple products and multiple modules, different technologies, cross product technologies, everything is together. AIML is involved, for example. All these are working together. And when I have an end-to-end -end product with multiple products inside, and if one of them misbehaves, or if one of them load changes, or if there is a unique scenario which is usually not possible in the normal workload distribution in the PSR environment, there is a unique scenario that in read and a write occurs on the same metadata or on the same table on for the same unique ID or a primary key, there may be a failure. So these kinds of testing where there are interdependable products, but there is as such maybe or may not be a hardware or a software failure as such, that is when operator reliability comes into picture. This cannot be tested at a component PSR phase because obviously component PSR is usually done on single components. And operator reliability is all about interdependent, cross-dependent products or modules or microservices working together. So operator reliability is a different ball game altogether, and it can be done only on system phase from an end-to-end -end perspective. And that too, not an individual product, but you have multiple products together. Hope reliability is clear, at least the 
what reliability is and how can we bifurcate it into different tests is clear. Let's move on. Now, what is resiliency? A few minutes ago, I was actually telling you that uh, reliability and resiliency testing is basically understanding and accepting that the product will have failures. It is not about making the product or the system fault free. It is about accepting that there would be failures and we are going to handle the failures. During the handling phase of failures, what is the impact? What is the amount or measurement of the impact of failure is what resiliency is. Let me not use some hi-fi terms and uh, go to a basic level of explanation. Now, resiliency is when there is a system failure and it failed. For example, let me talk about failover testing. So a one unit of the product and another unit of product are connected via load balancer and one of them is a master and the other one of them is a slave mode. And when the master mode fails, the slave actually takes over. But do you know in reality, the data in both the databases, assuming that the databases are also separated and we have a master database and a standby database, just for example purposes. And when the master database fails, the standby product or a standby unit system is taking over. The database also comes up from the standby. But do you know in reality, the master database and standby database are not always point to point on the same same uh, data. There is always a period of time or an interval at which the master database and say standby database get synced. So between my last sync and my the next sync, there is a failure and the master database failed or the master system itself failed. There is a data loss. Now, how much is the data loss? What is the impact of the data loss is what is resiliency. Reliability is about how it failed. How can I handle it? In this situation, the master product or the master system and the master unit failed and the standby is taking over. So there is a failure and the master went down. The slave is becoming the master. That is how we are handling it. We have a system in place, but there is some nanoseconds and there is a failure and that nanoseconds of data is missing. For rewriting it, there needs to be either repeated transactions or you're writing it in buffer and once the standby uh, unit comes into uh, vogue, it actually is going to the uh, cache and try rewriting it or from the buffer it's rewriting it or the transactions are going to be uh, reiterated. Uh, Say, for example, I know that uh, between master and standby, there is always, say, uh, 50 milliseconds of delay. I will ensure that the 50 milliseconds of data is repeated. But do I know what transactions happened and what is my loss? Let me give you a live example to understand the impact of resiliency and understand what really resiliency and why we need to do resiliency. So let me take a live example. Uh, the easiest to understand, in my opinion, is a banking system. Now, let's take for an example. Uh, during a festival season, uh, I have a master as well as a standby uh, systems that are connected in my bank on which my server is sitting. Okay. So during a peak festive season, the system goes down and standby comes over. Now during exactly during the failure time, I am doing some transactions. Let me see. So it's a festive season. I want to buy something. I go to an e-commerce site and I'm actually purchasing something, say for 500 rupees. So that's a debit as far as the banking transactions goes. Correct? Fair enough. Okay. So now I'm actually buying something from my uh, card, debit card on an e-commerce site for 500 rupees, okay? But I've sent my card through somebody to the ATM 
to just withdraw some thousand rupees cash because I want to go out or I am withdrawing myself, whatever is the case. So there is a total debit of 500 and 1000. So there are debits of 1500. OK, at the same time, say one of my uh, family members or friends are actually transferring from their account to my account 10,000 rupees. Now look at the values I am spending or my debits is 500 and 1000, whereas my credit is 10,000 rupees. All the three transactions are lost. For example, during the failure where my master database master is actually coming down and the uh, standby is coming up, there is only a few milliseconds of difference. And in this milliseconds, I have three transactions which failed. OK, I have withdrawn the cash. I have 1000 rupees in my hand, but I do have two debits, which is 500 and 1000, which are not accommodated or accounted in my account, in my bank account. There is a 10,000 rupees transfer that somebody has done from their account, which is a different bank. So their bank has actually accounted the transaction and 10,000 rupees has been debited in their account but I did not receive it because I lost the transaction. There is no way to retrieve what are the transactions because these are all online transactions and bank transactions are never saved in cash. This is a security issue. They don't save it. What will happen? There is data loss and the impact is the bank lost 1,500 rupees and it, I have taken 1000 rupees cash on top of it and I've purchased something with 500 and the bank lost a 10,000 rupees transaction because it did not, it, the other bank has already debited it. So I have a proof to show to the bank that yes, this person has sent me 10,000, but it is not accounted in my bank uh, savings bank. So you need to give me 10,000 rupees. So if you see in an ideal system, where none of these transactions are accounted for, for one single person during this milliseconds of time, the bank is at a loss of 10,000 plus 1,000 plus 500. That is 11,500 in total. So that's the impact during a failure. I can give you various examples and various domains. I can tell you about defense where that nanosecond of uh, delay or uh, network failure or uh, uh, latency or anything else is actually causing the uh, satellite to turn around in some other position and um, a miss of one degree in uh, rotation and the um, rocket or a bomb is actually going from one country to another country instead of doing it in a test space it's probably hitting a city i can give you another example where live surgery is happening in a on say a brain or a heart of a person and uh, one nanosecond of latency that occurred during some kind of a failure actually ensures that the surgeon is actually going and cutting a few millimeters or even less than some nanometers in the brain instead of having on the left he's gone to the right and cut another part of it so these are various things where you will have the impact of failures and that is why resiliency measurements is extremely important during reliability testing and for now i think everybody already understood but i would like to reiterate that resiliency and reliability tests go hand in hand it's just the perspective how we look at reliability and resiliency because reliability is all about how many times failures happen how much is the time for the uh, product for the system to bounce back to normal whereas resiliency tests is about understanding the impact understanding the depth of impact understanding the absorption of impact of failure i hope my examples made it more clear let's move on now, after such vast explanations of reliability and resiliency test, I guess the measurements which we need to do during reliability and resiliency test will be um, very simple. 
Let's go with reliability PSR measurements during any reliability test in the PSR environment. The first one is mean time to failure. So if there are failures, different types of failures occur in a product, in a system, in multiple units or a single unit of system. System in the sense there are many modules, there are many microservices, there may be interconnected products, by the way. So between two different failures, consecutive failures, what is the mean time to failure? So if in a period of say 24 hours or a 48 hours or a three months period, you're having 10 failures or 15 failures, what is the mean time of failure between each failure? That is extremely important because you can anticipate what would be the possible next mean fail failure time also. And we also should also have a, a contingency plan where we are going to reduce the mean time to failure or actually increase the mean time to failure. Sorry, not reduce, but it is increase. The more the mean time is, which means the lesser the failures are, or you have handled the failures in a better manner. The next one is mean time to repair. The mean time to repair is basically from a normal operation, there is a failure that occurs and it comes back to normal operation. So mean time to repair is between normal operation and normal operation. When the adverse condition occurs or the failure occurs, till the time you have controlled it or handled it and the system comes back to normal. See, that is mean time to repair. Now mean time between failures is basically, uh, it is calculated in two different formulae. Uh, that also depends upon whether your technical product owner or your product owner in your organization is able to give you whatever is the mean time defined between failures and that's a requirement given to the PSR team. Then it is very simple. Mean time between failures is usually mean time to failure plus mean time to repair. That is between two failures. If you don't have that and you need to measure on a live system or a production system or bring it back to the PSR environment, either ways, you do not know if there is no defined requirement for it then during the entire total maintenance of time, you need to calculate how many type number of repairs and failures have occurred, and you calculate the mean time between failures. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, in a warehouse, there have been multiple, it's a warehouse application, and there have been multiple failures during the entire year. So mean time between failures will be total maintenance time in the last one year, by the total number of repairs. Let me give you an, another example. In a building's industrial environment, there is a constant maintenance of say, ACs, water coolants, et cetera, et cetera, or turbines or something else, okay? Where you know that the system is going to be brought down to do an upgrade or to uh, right, uh, refill the fluents or uh, actually try and test uh, the turbine system or fans or a fan failure happens. And since the fan failures happen, you can repeatedly uh, do a servicing on the fans or anything like that, okay? Now, these are repeated activities, for example, and you very well know that you will have to bring down the system for say one minute every, uh, every uh, one month, two months or something. So in a total year, let's keep it as once in one month, easier for calculations. So in a year, I will have 12 different times that I will have to do the service. And the term, amount of time is basically 12 minutes per year. So the total maintenance time is 12, 12 minutes. And the total number of repairs, I don't have to, in that one uh, minute of downtime, I may be replacing five fans in a unit. So the number of repairs is five per month. So five into 12, 60. So the mean time between failures is 12 minutes by 60 repairs. That gives you mean time between failures. So these are the two ways to calculate mean time between failures. And the only measurements in reliability testing is mean time to failure, mean time to repair, 
and mean time between failures. There is no other reliability measurements anywhere. Be it software, be it OS, be it hard, be it a, a, a chip level, uh, uh, like an Intel company at a chip level, you are actually doing uh, PSR testing. Whatever you do, these are the only three measurements that happen in reliability testing. Let's go to resiliency PSR measurements. Now I have listed out various measurements or KPIs here. You will see that almost all of them are usually the measurements during a single load test like a one hour load test. So what's the difference between uh, a normal load test measurements and whatever is listed down here as part of resiliency measurements? There is a small catch here and this is the usual mistake every PSR engineer does. So I would like to explain this, kindly listen to this carefully. Now during a failure, a failure occurred on a normal system. There is a condition that is occurring, then the event occurs. This gap might not be in as elaborately as what is shown in this uh, diagram. It is as small as uh, less than a nanosecond possibly or less than a millisecond or probably 10 milliseconds or 5 milliseconds or 2 milliseconds. Depends on what product you are testing, in which environment you are testing, what is the hardware, what is the failure, what is your handling capacity in that product, etc. But having said that, there is a condition that is about to occur and then it actually triggers an event in your product and the event actually is detected. There is a detecting detection control detects that there is an event that occurred which is faulty. So basically the fault occurred and it, the uh, application or your system or your project is getting into a faulty or degraded operation here. During this time there is a response since there is a action. There is a reaction. What might be the reaction that probably the master is going down? It is detecting that uh, there is a hardware failure and the uh, master system is going down. OK, now it is still in the degraded mode of operation. We are recovering it by actually pulling it the standby to become the master. And it takes some time for all the transactions and all the units and all the nodes to come up, for example, and come back to normal operation. Now there is a series of events that are happening in the product in the system. Hard might, hardware might failure because hardware failed. In one of the modules or one of the units, the connectivity between different nodes is lost. The connectivity to database is lost. Then when the standby system comes up, there will be a sequence of the different units and modules that need to become that need to be first taking over as a priority. So there will be a priority one, priority two, priority 10 and priority 15, for example. So all these events are happening within your product. A product is not about one single 10 lines of code. It's some millions of code written in different modules or cross products together, correct? Now, why did I say all these things? To make you understand, let's take response time or latency. OK, now in a normal condition, for example, my latency or my response time for end to end use case in the system, in the application, in the product is, for example, say uh, 50 milliseconds. OK. When the adverse condition is occurring here at this point where my arrow is showing you here, probably when the adverse condition is about to occur from 50 milliseconds, it increased to 55 or 60 milliseconds. When that event occur or the failure occurred, it went to 100 milliseconds. And I'm talking about single user here. This is all about PSR testing. You're testing this scenario in a PSR environment. And when the system is detected that there is a fault occurring, it went to 200 milliseconds. When there is a mitigation faulty operation, there is a response. Everything is on a standstill. There is a, a, a all the transactions are stopped. Everything is just standstill. That is when from 200 milliseconds it went to say uh, one second. I'm just making this up in this case. Okay, here. 
and during the recovery from one second, it is going back to 700 milliseconds. It takes a longer time to come back to say 50 milliseconds. Now resiliency testing is about all these events. So even when you are doing a single user, the system has turned from 50 milliseconds to 100 to 200 to one second and then coming back to 700 milliseconds in this. So this pattern is what is important in resiliency testing. In a normal load testing, usually we report that the average or the 95th or the 90th percentile of response time with under load of 10 users, 100 users, 1000 users or 1 million users is 50 milliseconds. In this case, you cannot give that the peak uh, or 95th percentile or average during the failure for 100 users has been one second. That's incorrect resiliency. So you need to know when the fault is occurring, is it dry? Is it shooting up from 50 to 200 milliseconds or is it shooting up from 50 to one second to 10 seconds to three seconds to one second again? And from 50 milliseconds, is it going to one second or from 50 milliseconds, is it going to 50 milliseconds or 30 milliseconds or is it staying back at 100 milliseconds? This whole pattern measurement is extremely important in resiliency. So in resiliency testing, whether you are doing it under load or a single user does not matter. What matters is when the whole entire system is stable, what is my latency? When adverse condition is occurring, how much did the latency turn out to be? After the failure occurs, how much did it happen? And what happened when the system actually in, uh, realized that the failure occurred and it started failing? Some units started failing, some logs have been written or some APIs have not uh, got any uh, response back and they are actually in wait time and the response time increased, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. During all these events, what is the latency? So in your resiliency testing report, you need to have not a single latency value, but multiple values at different points of interval of time. If you understand resiliency PSR measurements, your report should contain a pattern of response time, a pattern of disk space, pattern of CPU, RAM, DNS errors, everything, any of these things is actually not a single measurement. There are multiple measurements from normal period to another normal condition. So it is between normal condition to normal condition at the verge of happening of a failure till the failure is handled and the system comes back to normal. So all in all, bottom line, though you see the same types of measurements, the KPIs are the same, whether it's a load test or for a resiliency test, what you measure, how you measure, what's your perspective of measurement is changed. Hope that's clear. The next topic I really want to explain is the difference between uh, reliability and resiliency testing and chaos testing. In PSR world, usually these two words are actually uh, used very loosely and uh, they are used whenever whoever likes to use any kind of words like I just I'm used to using the word reliability I keep using the word or if I like using chaos testing I keep using the word chaos but they are two entirely different types of testing let me explain reliability and resiliency testing as we understood so far during the session is that you either have a hardware failure or a network failure or an OS failure or a software failure or a microservices went down. So these are all different scenarios like scenario 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 100, whatever they are. So they are all isolated incidents, which means I am trying to understand that if a database unit the server or the hardware on which the database is sitting fails or if the story suddenly has uh, errors in it because of whatever reason. Okay, 
how do I handle it? What is the mean time of failure and how am I handling it and bringing back the system to normal is reliability testing. So you have various scenarios like that. Coming to chaos testing. Chaos testing is about random failures that are introduced in the system at the same time, which means all these isolated scenarios, some of them or all of them are happening at the same time. And you are actually trying to observe when there is chaos, random chaos that is happening in the product. How is it actually behaving? Reliability is about an individual isolated failure that is occurring in the product or the system and trying to measure it, trying to handle it. How much is the mean time failure calculating it? Are we ready for that? Are we explaining that as, an, uh, uh, as a uh, point of uh, knowledge to the customer while signing uh, the product to them or while selling the product to them is reliability. Chaos testing is like having a tsunami, having an earthquake and a hurricane at the same time on a product in a house. But how many times do really chaos testing happen? So chaos testing happens only when you have too much of para too many parameters, variables that happen in a product at the same time. Reliability testing is about measurement in an ideal situation where only one failure occurs and handling it. It is possible in real life, in real scenarios that more than one scenario, like say, in this case, just as an example, scenario 1, 8 and 12 occur at the same time. But you are you are actually measuring how to handle scenario 1 and handling it, scenario 8 and handling it, scenario 12 and handling it. That's reliability because the measurements is all about resiliency and going and fixing the product, how to handle it, how to reduce it. Chaos testing, on the other hand, is about some of these or all of these being introduced into your PSR environment on the product at the same time that too in a random fashion. There is no sequence to it. There is chaos. As the word suggests, it's complete chaos. So they are two different tests. The measurements are different. Why you do them is very different. What you do, how you do, why you do, when you do it is very different. Reliability testing you introduce the failures into your PSR environment on the product at regular intervals because you need to measure between two failures what is happening in the product. Chaos testing is not about it. Chaos testing is about randomly introducing every type of failure and then pulling it back and seeing what is happening in the product. You're not measuring anything. You're not measuring the response time. You're not measuring the database errors. You're not measuring the disk errors. You are not measuring the issues in storage. You're not measuring whether the uh, database threads or the application threads are coming back. Are there GC failures? No. Chaos testing is about just dumping different failures and seeing what's happening to the product. Is it failing gracefully? That's all. So reliable testing and resiliency testing is different from chaos testing. Kindly understand that both can be done. Both should be done. Yes, but are they same? No. So that ends my introduction to reliability and resiliency testing. There are further videos uh, I have put in the comments to understand further about various reliability testing and various uh, resiliency testing, various uh, types of tests that you can do on your uh, products and what measurements you do and how they are actually reported. So happy reliability testing. Thank you.